All right. We will be looking at on the topic of the day of the Lord, and so uh, looking at the millennial kingdom and talking about the blessings associated with the kingdom. And so we're going to be, well, I'll put a couple of those up. Just a reminder, the thousand-year reign of Christ uh, is going to take place, obviously, after the second coming and after the end of the uh, tribulation period. Seven-year tribulation will end with the battle of Armageddon. The end of that, Christ will return. There will be the destruction of the armies of unbelief, Antichrist armies. Antichrist himself and the false prophet will actually be the first two inhabitants of the lake of fire. Uh, they'll be cast directly into the lake of fire, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, Satan himself will be bound for that thousand-year period of time. And so then Jesus will come and will reign uh, for a thousand years on this earth. So in fulfillment of all the promises to Israel, and all the promises in the Old Testament as far as the Davidic king coming, the land promises being enjoyed by Israel, Israel effectively becoming a kingdom of priests, and really uh, the ministry uh, uh, from centered in Jerusalem, the blessings that really humanity was meant to enjoy, and not even at the full magnitude yet, because the full magnitude of what we're meant to experience will not come until the uh, eternal kingdom, because this world was afflicted by sin because of men's rebellion. And so with the world now fallen, uh, this world will actually enjoy a time period of unprecedented peace, of unprecedented blessing, because Christ himself will rule uh, with a rod of iron from the throne of Jerusalem. Uh, all sin will be dealt with in an immediate fashion, in a personal fashion. Uh, so the, the magnitude of blessing that even is possible on this earth, we've never even fully experienced. So uh, I was reading an analogy, so I, it's... it's Anyway, a couple different books and reading, but one of the analogies is, you know, if you've never experienced something. So when you were little, so our, like our kids, I'll just make a, a cheap analogy maybe. But when we were little, we, you know, we'd do the dollar menu. You know, when you're driving on trips especially, dollar menu. You gave the kids, they had so many items they could choose. Even as they got older, you'd kind of refine that. And, and then eventually, you know, the, our older kids make fun of us because by the time we got to the place where the younger one was one, they were in college and you're running around town, then we would suddenly stop at Chick-fil-A. You know, so Chick-fil-A versus uh, McDonald's and they would make fun that he was the spoiled one. And we're just saying, well, when there were four of you and Chick-fil-A wasn't actually in the budget. <laughs> but, you know, uh, when you're young, and so I can think back when I, you know, so when, when I was young growing up, you know, we... Uh, go out to eat that was usually a treat and so you enjoyed that and and so some of the things you look forward to but you never when you were little and you could look forward to a mcdonald's hamburger that's hard to believe but you could all right because i heard another thing you know somebody had a mcdonald's hamburger they had kept in their pocket of a coat it was six years later they pulled it out it still looked the same that's a problem <laughs> anyway that's a whole nother story but when you're little, young and dumb you look forward to those those things that you probably shouldn't uh, but you hadn't experienced yet a filet mignon. You know what I mean? You hadn't experienced that yet. Your parents had not probably, you know, when you're, maybe you're the exception, I don't know, but my kids when they were young hadn't experienced filet. That was much later. But, you know, once you've experienced filet mignon, or for me, Longhorn, then McDonald's doesn't have any appeal at all. Okay? Now, my point of why the point of the silly illustration is you really don't understand how great heaven's going to be. You don't have a clue. You've never experienced it. And because we've never experienced the glory that is that great, we can't imagine it. What we can know is the things that we enjoy here. And we can't imagine something that is so great that it eclipses anything we've ever known here. And eclipses it is at such a level that the things we call joy here won't even seem like much. And all the sorrows, no matter how deep and penetrating they are, all the hurts that you think you'd never get by or never forget, actually will be eclipsed by glory. They will be incomparable, inconsequential. You'll never think of them again. And so the magnitude of glory is something that needs to stretch our thinking. And so hopefully these texts will help. We've looked at the spiritual blessings, and I'm just going to not really re go through those. There's going to be great spiritual blessings associated with the kingdom, evident in the gifts, salvation, new heart, a uh, new really keeping of a, a, really a changed heart, changed disposition, which is a part of regeneration. Genuine regeneration produces that. Uh, we talked last time about the ethical blessings, so genuine ethics. Uh, again, again the, the, the world ruled by Christ with the rod of iron and the impact of that. 
Um, and I'll just pray. So I right now my uh, and I'll just this is my again. Yeah, the, uh, there we go. So I, maybe I can get that. All right. See, I my right eye is connected, supposed to be corrected for distance. My left eye is supposed to be up close. That's worked really well until this last year. Suddenly my right eye is kind of crash, and so we've been trying to work through that. Still haven't got it right, so I don't know what we're going to have to do to fix all that. But my vision of my right eye has radically changed in this last year. So then me looking at some of those, sometimes I look at them and go, yeah, I can, no, I can't read that. Never mind. So you know what? I feel my pain, right? Uh, yeah, wait till I get old. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, anyway. When we look at the ethical blessings, what we're talking about, so the first one is just the moral, abs- you know, moral, the g- moral values. So we'll have an absolute objective standard of righteousness. No more will evil be called good. That's the point. Uh, what we talked about this morning, the magnitude of deception will be stripped away. You know, you wouldn't, no one would, you know, if you think years ago this happened and this was in Chicago, somebody went in to, a, a, to like a 7-Eleven type store, they took out uh, some Tylenol and they substituted poison in, put them back on the shelves. People came in, thought they were taking something to help them that actually killed them. Now, if they knew they were poisoned, they never would have taken it. The deception was real. They thought they were taking something to help them. And it's, a, it's just a reality that, that in this culture, in a fallen world, things that, are, that are, are offered to you as something helpful oftentimes are nothing but a masquerade of that which will kill you. And people will believe it by the lie, and they will take what you've given them. And sometimes that's ideological, meaning their ideas, their thoughts about what makes society tick or how a world ought to run. Uh, or what is moral, what's not, all of those kind of things are a part of a social order that's in disarray, and it's in disarray because the human heart's in disarray. And there, will be, there is no fix for the human heart except salvation. Salvation reorients, but we're still sinners that are going to struggle with having a right orientation because many times we rely, again, on our old nature, and that just creates, again, even chaos or confusion among the people of God. But certainly we live in a culture that that's the case. It won't be the case in the millennial kingdom. There will be an objective standard of righteousness. No one will argue with God in that day. God's word will stand. The truth will be coming forward from Jerusalem. So it will be absolute righteousness that's going to govern. Uh, no longer wicked will be honored. The wicked will no longer be honored. No one will look. Call them noble. Uh, people will discern. Then they will actually discern between, good and wi- uh, between righteousness and wickedness. Those who serve God and those who do not. And so that will be the case throughout um, there's this, sorry, the second one honored. And then the third is that there, uh, so the moral vir- the virtue of truth will be exalted throughout the kingdom. Uh, so he will bring forth the justice. He will faithfully minister justice. Uh, so the virtue of truth will actually uh, be direct and then retribution will be uh, immediate. Wrongdoing will be exclusively uh, be dealt with on a personal level. So I talked about all that last time. So Here's where I want to kind of pick up and keep going. Millennial blessing, uh, the millennial kingdom will bring great social blessings. That's a great topic for today. There's so much stuff being talked about in social justice. I mean, it's a big topic. It's actually invaded. In fact, uh, several denominations have been invaded by this thought uh, of what social justice demands and what it looks like and how to get there. We live in a culture filled with ideas. I mean, even what we see governing authorities, what their idea of what a government should look like, what it shouldn't look like, how should we bring social order, or can we bring social order, how do we legislate it, how do we have laws for protecting what we perceive to be rights. I always think that's funny, because what right do sinners have? Serious. It's the rights we perceive to have, but actually we have only one right, which is to love and obey God, because that's what we were created to do. After that, everything else is what we presume upon ourselves. But that's a whole other story. But anyway, partly as we have a world not ruled with a biblical worldview, so we come out with all kinds of ideologies uh, that are actually aimed at sometimes correcting what we see as social injustice, but we're foolish enough to think somehow we can legislate it. And the reality is you can't, because what's broken in humanity can't be fixed by humanity. Okay? You can't fix what's broken in the human culture. Because what's broken in the human culture, you can, uh, you can put laws to try and uh, to eliminate certain aspects of social injustice, but it'll always come back around because as long as you're still being legislated by sinners, sinners find ways to take advantage of other sinners. 
In a fallen and broken world, you'll never have a perfect system. It's impossible. Humanity cannot legislate social justice because humanity cannot legislate a, a, a just heart. And what does it take to have social justice an actual just heart? So it, it, will, not, it will not take place without actually a transformation, without the millennial kingdom actually coming. And a part of the millennial kingdom coming is warfare will actually be abolished. Can you imagine that? There's military conflict all over the world today. We have soldiers dying every day. I mean, it's not very well covered. We'll hear about it here and there. But the reality is, is we have men and women in physical harm's way every day in the, from our country in other nations. Facing combat situations, live fire, death, all of that's going on. And it's happening regularly. And then we hear there's skirmishes in many nations. There's uprising in many nations, nation against nation groups against groups, there's constant turmoil and warfare. I mean, we don't have to go far in American culture to have the internal warfare that goes on between various factions of our own country, you know, you'll, like the gun-free zones, right? <laughs> Where how many people died last week in that city? I won't go there, but, you know, I mean, we, we have enough conflict going on even internally in our own nation. Uh, so here's what's going to happen, Psalm 46 and verse 9, he makes wars to cease. So that to the end of the earth, he breaks the bow, cuts the spear in two, and he burns the chariots with fire. Hosea 2 and verse 18. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the bird of the air, with the creeping things in the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth. I will make them lie down in safety. Hosea longed for a day when people would be able to lie down in safety. God saying that day is coming. Micah remind, says, that in Micah it says, He will judge between many peoples, rebuke strong nations afar. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up, put that text up, sorry. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under the vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Imagine no more thievery, no more warfare, no more military, no more reserves, no more National Guard, no more F-35s or whatever the next plane is going to be or whatever the next military technology will be unneeded. You know, when Jesus rules with a rod of iron and he can simply speak and everything that is in rebellion, when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation, you realize with the sword of his mouth, he slays the armies of unbelief, which means he speaks the word, they die. Okay, which that could happen today anytime and does happen. God still is actively involved in judging humanity. People die every day. And actually it's appointed unto man once die. Don't forget who's in control of life and death, not people, God. God determines the day of one's destiny, not man. Men do not rule their own life or their own death. They do not. The sovereign God of heaven does. He gives life, he takes life. And so here's where we, we come in the kingdom. There'll be no need for military armament. People will not be fighting. There will be no fight. People will not be stealing. They won't have to be protective. They'll have their own uh, fig tree. They'll enjoy the blessing. And so these kind of the unjust, social injustices will never be righted until the Lord actually returns to rule. So social injustices become a reality. They will build houses. They will inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and they will eat their fruit. They will build and in, in not another, they shall not build in another and inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree, so shall be the days of my people. My elect shall, shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth their tr- children for trouble. They shall be the descendants, uh, they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. An amazing day. I mean, th- this doesn't exist, folks. People build things, other people inhabit them. People build companies, people build fortunes, leave it behind. In fact, we talked about that in Ecclesiastes, you know. You might be able to build a fortune, leave it behind, and those behind are a fool. And what happens to what you left behind? You certainly aren't going to rule it. You won't determine it. And here we have this promise of the day is coming when your life will be like that of a tree. I mean, you ever cut down one of those big trees, look at all the rings, figure out how long it's been around? You know, there's still olive trees in Jerusalem, been there since before Christ. So that's what he's talking about. Remember, the people will live the entire thousand years. Human life will be what it's always intended to be. It will be that which will flourish. uh, And labor will not be in vain. I always like to look at it this way. I cannot tell you how many projects I have been a part of doing. I cannot tell you how many times I've driven to Home Depot. 
I can't tell you how many times I've driven back to Home Depot and again and again for what I forgot or for what didn't fit, what didn't work, what got broken. Uh, you're in the middle of whatever project and it takes all this extra time because you had to make the, ne- the 32 or whatever number trip back to get what you forgot or what, again, didn't fit or didn't work like it was supposed to. Um, that's never going to happen in the kingdom. It's amazing. Labor will never be in vain. I mean, they'll imagine the, fr- the, the productivity of a kingdom when that's the kind of, uh, the, the kind of labor that's going to take place without the futility of sin. So, social justice is part of that. Human life will be tenderly fostered and nourished. The true justice among people, a bruised reed will he not break, a smoking flax will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. So not a single soul will be needlessly sacrificed on the altar of society good. No more social engineering. Anyway, I could get, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll resist. I could go on a whole side sermon there. <laughs> Uh, I am very thankful. I was just at ACS, and so I was very thankful. I'm thankful uh, to the very fact that we still have uh, a currently a protection for Christian ed, and that exists right now. I was actually a, a, even uh, there's. I seriously doubt we'll ever see the day when Vermont legislators will let us have true schools of choice. Um, but you know that is happening across the nation. And I think there's like 23 states now it's taken place. Now they're, they're all being sued. They're trying to block it on various things. They really want to try and get the SOGI laws in place so they can exclude all Christian uh, entities. There actually is a lawsuit right now being taken forward from the, uh, uh, those defending, um, so it's America Defending Freedom, ADF. Anyway, so they are, the lawsuit in Vermont, against Vermont, one of the things in Vermont currently, our students in our Christian school cannot take um, dual enrollment for credit. They're excluded. So that is being taken. Now, now the reason why it's an important case, because I'll just illustrate it. Sorry, it's a little side piece of each, but here's the realities. Okay, we have a preschool. Everybody in Vermont can get 10 hours of free preschool paid for by the government. So anybody can have 10 hours of free preschool paid for by the government. It's called Act 166. Look it up. If you want, want to look it up. That happened the year I got here. Uh, so, but Christian schools can't receive it. And the only reason we can't receive it is because we have Christian curriculum. So everybody in Vermont can qualify, but no Christian school. Even though we meet all the state regs and we're certified as a preschool, and we have to meet all the regs. In fact, the local preschool is one of the bigger ones. Two of them just went, they, they just closed two, two of them in our area. So uh, we, we maintain state regs. It's a very difficult thing to maintain anymore. And they keep making it more and more difficult, but you do know why. Ultimately, they want to control children at the lowest age, and they're going to just basically tax it out all of us to pay for it. That's their goal, which is to shut down all forms of other education. But, so the push against it is to come back so that we actually can foster and nurture, not socially engineer. I mean, social engineering is the reality of what, in fact, even I appreciate some have, have, have said this. I said this a few, anyway. We don't have public education anymore. We have government education different. It's now driven not by policy of the parent, not really going to be parent-oriented. It's going to be government ideologically driven. And parents are just told to step aside. If you don't believe it, just look around at all the different laws and things that are being passed as far as people being able to opt their children out of various education. And so they're constantly just driving that wedge down. That's the kind of day we live in. That's, it's a broken day. The idea of nurturing and fostering is there's no more going to be social engineering, no more experimentation, nobody's going, there's no Holocaust, folks. There's none of that. There's none of this guinea pig stuff that we're going to say, let's take trials and put people through trials to figure out what what happens when we do certain things to them, whether it's ideologically, even brainwashing, or whether it's uh, physically by giving them certain, um, our experiments both with food sources and and medicines and everything else. Those kind of things will not happen. There'll be no more addiction. You know, the reality is it's been uncovered, the whole opiate addiction that swept our nation. They actually knew they were that addictive when they sold it. They knew it. They knew what they were doing. And it's turned a whole series within our own culture of a level of drug dealer doctors. Because people are so addicted, they'll sell their souls for them. And that's one of the reasons why our social system is so overloaded, because so people are so addicted to things that we knew would addict them, 
and they're driven by them. They, they're in the midst of them, and we, they're, they're, it's, people are profiting off of it, and other families are being destroyed, and families, children end up in a social system that's broken. That's the kind of day that we live in. Um, that kind of thing will not take place ever again in the kingdom of God. There's so much to look forward to. The millennial kingdom will bring great social blessings. It will bring genuine social justice. The reality is humanity all deserves the same thing, judgment what we all deserve and when God reigns from his throne then there will be the, there, there will be justice in the society because people will not be allowed to sin and be little or take advantage of others it won't be allowed, it won't happen so social justice will be a reality because that which is broken in humanity will be actually uh, being legislated by law by, the, by Christ and enforced by sheer power of a, an almighty God you know the perfect government is a as an absolute dictatorship. Perfect government. But you have to have an absolutely just dictator. And unfortunately, there is no such qualified candidates in this world. We have none. Anybody with absolute power, uh, that's the old saying, right? Absolute power absolutely corrupts, right? Well, it does if you're corrupt. It does if you're fallen. But Jesus Christ ruling with a rod of iron will be the absolute right government. One governing or, you know, Lord, because he's perfect. So the right political system will actually be a political system dominated by Christ himself, the righteous judge. That's why he's called that over and over. He will sit on the throne. There will be no need for checks and balances, no Supreme Court to overrule, no, uh, none of these things are going to take place. Nobody's make a constitutional appeal. They're not going to believe in a living document. <laughs> we have the word, well, I guess we do. We have a living word, uh, but it doesn't change what it means. It just means it's always applicable and always working. A little different than what we mean by a living constitution. That's another whole side story. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Many people shall come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, rebuke many people. And so here is the rule of Christ. So we have a, a, a political system that is going to be, all, all form of authority is going to be in a monarchy with an absolute king with absolute power, and that's the right kind of kingdom because that king has absolute righteousness. And so then it'll be governed through his people, through his redeemed bride, which will be taking part in politically actually ruling over society. It's part of what the Bible talks about. So we will be ruling over society in a kingdom. Uh, good news is, is by that point in time, once you're full, when your redemption's complete, you'll no longer be a sinner. So you being given power to actually rule will be okay. Today, if we were all given absolute power, we'd all be absolutely corrupt because our hearts couldn't handle it, okay? In the kingdom, not so. We'll have redeemed fully. The work of redemption will be fully accomplished. No more sin, no more sin nature at all, no more battle with sin. And so the laws of righteousness will go from and be a perfect governing system. Not only will we have perfect government, but we're actually going to have great physical blessings. No more snowstorms. Amen. Amen. Man, I didn't get an amen. You guys are something. I, do you know that snow is a part of the curse? Just saying. It's a part of the curse, folks. There was no snow in Eden. No snow in Eden, I promise. No rain, no snow, perfect weather every day. There was no blazing heat either, all right? So nobody was getting blazed and cooked, no, no, none of that. You just had perfect weather all the time, perfect fertility, I mean, a perfect environment. Yes, you know, when the millennial kingdom comes, no more snowstorms, done. No more blazing heat, no more scorchings. Uh, so that, that's going to be a great blessing. No more shoveling, amen. No more slipping on ice and breaking their legs. My wife likes that, so... Uh, that is not going to happen, right? No storm. I mean, think about how much we've, we've tried. We think at times, I always like the, you know, all the fake healers out there that say they can, you know, they can basically, they can, they can pretty much just pray anything into happening. You just, just note, when the hurricane's coming where they are, they fly out of there, okay? They're on their planes flying the other direction, praying that God's going to stop it. Well, if you really can stop it, then go, to the, go right in the middle of it and just pray it out. They can't. No, we, we can't control the weather. We can't determine where it's going to go. We don't know. 
Uh, I mean, we all get, you know, I like the, predi- you know, you get the prediction so far out in advance and then you just watch it change. And then eventually, yeah, every now and then they get it right. I'd love to have, you know, what kind of, what a great job that is. It's kind of like a professional baseball batter. You know, they can hit like three out of ten and they can be paid millions. The weather guy gets about one out of ten right and everybody thinks he's brilliant, okay? Uh, so, again, weather just again shows, every, you know, I think Mark Twain quipped once, everybody talks about the weather, nobody does anything about it. Um, so, you know, we, all the different things that we see, and in fact, the Bible tells us these kind of things are going to continue to happen and continue to happen even in more and more ways around the world as we get closer to the end. You have a broken and fallen world, a world that's crying out, longing for redemption. You know the whole earth cries out for the day of redemption. The whole earth longs for the time when the curse of sin will be removed from this earth, when it'll actually function it was always intended. And so we live in the midst of a chaotic time of weather. Uh, there will be no weathermen, no weathermen to tune into. What's going to be the weather? Perfect. What is it going to be tomorrow? Perfect. What will be the day after that? Perfect. It will be perfect weather, endlessly perfect weather. No more natural disasters, no more flash floods, no more victims anymore of a death that happens at the hand of unpredicted weather. There will be peaceable wildlife. I mean, we're fascinated. We're fascinated when somebody cuddles up with, a, with you know, you see, uh, you'll see the videos of some guy who's got like, I mean, a pet tiger or a pet whatever, you know, they're cuddling up with this lion and, and you're thinking, oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah, until the kitty eats you. <laughs> you know, I mean, a guy, what was it, the zoo? It was a few years ago. The guys were taunting that tiger, and he was playing with them. They were playing, and the tiger was doing this and was reaching through. The guy got close enough. The tiger batted him on the arm. Arm fell off. The tiger was just playing. I mean, you don't even begin to understand the power of that, that animal until you go play with it, Okay. Uh, so I know they like to show all the cute videos of people hugging with their bear, or they're hugging with this or that, or the guy that swims with a crocodile and puts his head in the, the crocodile's mouth. Um, yeah, good for you until you die, yeah. which is going to happen pretty soon, so you keep doing that kind of folly. Uh, so we live with an animal kingdom that is not uh, going to be tamed, okay? It's not in this, this life, but in the day is going to come. I mean, can you imagine some of you have raised sheep? You want to go get a wolf and stick it in there? And in fact, the wolf herds were largely decimated. Now we're putting them back in a protective category. Probably not an intelligent thing to do, but anyway, so we'll see. Uh, but, you know, the wolf will lay down with the lamb. The leopard will uh, lie down with the young goat. The calf with the young lion the fatling, and the fatling together. The little child will lead them. That's what you want to see. Your child out there leading a lion and a calf and the and just that's going to go well. Yes. Not today. It will then. The cow and the bear will graze. The young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play at the cobra's hole. The weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. It will be an amazing day. I mean I, I, I mean, I think there's some of the exotic game, whatever you want to call them, or there's some pretty cool creatures that God has created. Some really cool creatures. In, in the kingdom, you actually would be able to go pet that lion with no fear. I mean, because the animals really were part of created to be a blessing to humanity. They are. They're meant for the glory of God and the blessing for his people. And yet, there's this, because of the fall, we have this, this level of the uncertainty of what is, we have some animals that can be domesticated, a whole bunch that cannot. Try as they might, they still don't. Okay, so we, we're going to be in the, in the coming kingdom. There will be the time when basically animals return to their pre-fall disposition uh, and their diet. The only thing that's kind of exceptional is the serpent will continue to eat dust. He didn't eat dust prior to the, to, to the curse, all right? So exactly the form of the serpent prior to the, it was different because that's part of the curse. They would eat dust the rest of their lives, the rest of their existence. So, uh, but we're going to see there no more... Uh, striking. Somebody was telling me, uh, I was with one of the guys at the the ACS, and he goes to India regularly to teach in one of the schools, and he said, you know, you'll stop at a, a, uh, he was was at, they were stopped, and there's always beggars, there's always different things in India, but the guy was, had the cobra in his basket, and he's knocking on your window with a cobra's head out there, and they want you to take a picture, because you take a picture, then they want money. So it's kind of the way it works. You'll see people with, with different animals. A lot of times elephants, especially in India, they'll have an elephant 
They'll bring it out and they want you to take a picture. You take a picture. They say, it's my elephant. You owe me money. And they will be very persistent to exhort you and you can argue with them if you want to. But once the police comes over there, guess who gets to pay? You do. It's not your country. It's not America. You'll learn that quickly. All right? So you take the picture and it's their animal. They're going to extort you for money. That's the way it works. So they come with their cobra and one of the guys is like, oh, that's cool. And he's like, that's a cobra. Don't roll down that window. I don't care how many times this guy's done this. You're going to roll down the window and invite, yeah, no, I don't think so. Uh, so anyway, so yes, in the kingdom, you will be able to pet the cobra. Not that I want to. I'm just not a big snake guy. So I'm probably not going to, I'll pass. I'll play with the lion, not the cobra. And that's me. Maybe you will. Uh, a couple of years ago, a guy caught a record-breaking muskie. You know how he caught it? He was fishing. He had his feet dangling in the water. The muskie bit his foot. Like the toes, they were wiggling. And the muskie wouldn't let go. So he, had, he put his foot in the boat. Finally, they got the muskie off 54 stitches later. And then the authorities heard about how he caught the muskie, and they took it away from him. <laughs> That's an illegal fishing. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Caught the muskie. All right, so no muskie's going to eat your foot. All right, that's not going to happen. All right, so that's all, all when we talk about the coming of physical blessings. Physical health will be enjoyed. Can you imagine this? And the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. And people, and the people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. The eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame shall leap like deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. No more sickness. Can you imagine? No more coronavirus. No more cancer. No more limes. No more any of that. I mean, no more eyesight that doesn't work anymore. No more glasses. Hey, Amen. Hearing aids gone. Glasses gone. I think Charlie was telling me he was out driving. Charlie, you know, is he in here? Where's Charlie? Yeah, Charlie's right here. Yes, Charlie, you know, to... I, you know, he's telling me that, you know, when it's snowing like that, he's got to get out and drive in it. I am not, I mean, that, you know, I, I just I may keep a leash on him a little bit anyway. No, I'm kidding. I say he's got to get out and explore. Well, he was out driving when it was snowing where you can barely see. It was almost whiteout condition, all right? So, and apparently there was a, lay, a blind lady that was go, out there getting back home in the middle of that. Now, why she was out there, she's a very brave woman or didn't have any other choices. I don't know. We don't really know the full story. But you know, the coming kingdom of God, there will be no blindness. No more sickness. I mean, we can't imagine a day without someone we know in this world being sick. No more children with any other infirmities, no more autoimmune diseases. They'll all be gone. There won't be one child born in the kingdom with any physical defect. Not one. There will not be a miscarriage, not one. No child lost, none. It won't happen. We can't imagine a world like that. We know a world filled with pain. That's what we know. Now, we choose to focus on the positives, and we should. I'm not trying to make you discouraged, but every day, children are lost. Every day, a child is born with some level of autoimmune or some other, uh, some other life-altering disease. We have life-altering reality. I mean, right now, they still don't know what, I mean, the magnitude of a disease. Just remember, part of the judgment of God coming in the tribulation, one of the horses that's released is pestilence, plague, disease. You can imagine what, I mean, we already know the kind of the panic. I mean, we don't really fully get it because it hasn't come that, to that magnitude in our country. If it did, we would all understand the panic or the, the, uh, the fear that is gripping people in, in China, where they have no idea where this is going to end. I mean, when you're locking down entire cities and it just keeps spreading, and you just keep trying to lock down the cities, and it's just spreading, they really do not fully understand all the ways it can spread. And that's why it just keeps, keeps going. And that kind of thing creates, obviously, a fear and panic. But that's just, you know, at this point in time, I think the percentage are saying it's about a 4% mortality rate. So 4% of the people who catch this end up dying. Well, just remember part of when this happens in the coming judgment of God on this earth, one-third of the entire world population die. It will be fearful. It will be incredibly fearful. And the world will still not repent because repentance is a gift from God, not a product of fear. So the day is coming when physical health will be enjoyed by all. 
The agony of disease and deformity will be removed. The great physician will be upon the throne and healing will be to all nations. No one will say in the kingdom, I'm sick. The productivity of harvest will, will be the rule. The water shall burst forth in the wilderness, the streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become as a pool. The thirsty land springs of water. The inhabit, habitation of the jackals where each lay. There shall be grass and reeds and rushes. So there will be a full climate change that will bring about great, uh, really, pre-fall productivity. The world will enjoy the benefits of all of that labor, of, all that, of really all that fertility. And the last one is this, ecclesiastical blessings. No more, uh, no more confused people religiously. No more cults. No more false religions. No more uh, preaching that takes Christ's name in vain. No, it won't happen. No false doctrine allowed will ever happen again. It will be absolute, the purity of God's, uh, of, the, of the gospel, really the purity will be in one religious ecclesiastical union joined together in the kingdom. So it will be church and state brought together under the king. Our king is both uh, sovereign and priest. He's the king priest. And so all religious teaching will come via for Christ. And so that's when it will be. He will make us joyful in a house of prayer. Burnt offerings and sacrifice will be accepted at the altar. And, though, and my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 61, you shall be named the priest of the Lord, and they shall call you servants of God. Um, Zechariah, I'll put this text up, and then they speak to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold the man whose name is Branch, from his place shall the branch come out, and shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, and it shall bear the glory. They shall sit under, the, and shall sit and rule on his throne, and shall be a priest on his throne. The council of peace shall be between them both. Zechariah 14 and it shall be called, be called, it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come to Jerusalem and worship the king, Lord of hosts, on them will go no rain. If the family of Egypt do not come, they shall have no rain. They shall receive plagues, which the Lord will strike the nations who do not come. So here's going to be perfect, uh, I mean, a perfect ecclesiastical blessing coming from Christ. And if anybody doesn't come, there will be immediate judgment. Okay, that's during the tribulation, I mean, during the millennial kingdom that we're talking about. So there will be perfect ecclesiastical union. There will no, no more separation issues that we're going to be dealing with. Okay? We'll all worship perfectly. I think we're going to learn, uh, maybe we'll learn Hebrew then or Greek. I don't know. We'll, it, we'll actually have a common language system. We'll all understand. Uh, and we'll be able to worship together in, in a full and in, in really beautiful worship. And the house will be the house of prayer for all nations. All will come. All will offer their offerings. That will take place in the millennial temple. That's why the centerpiece of the millennial kingdom is a temple. And all will come. And the, the, the temple will be a massive expansion of what is there. Even Jerusalem, the new, the new holy city, will be massively expanded. And the nations will gather in the presence of Christ. And there will be great, ecclesia, there will be great uh, spiritual blessings as a result of great worship blessings as well. Uh, so false doctrine will be over forevermore. And that will be a great blessing. There will be true unity then, right? Believers are called to live in unity. The reason why we can't is because there's not all together agreement on all issues theologically and it doesn't mean that they're all up for debate they're not <laughs> it just means that we don't always solve the issue right so when two people disagree theologically you know what you can't be both right okay you can both be wrong but you can't both be right so that's the you know so in the in, in the, when christ is ruling from the throne king priest and presence and we will have no misinterpretation none be no, no confusions uh, in, in, our, in the way we worship. It will be very clear. And the Lord will be honored in it. And it, I love that text in Isaiah 61, 6, which reminds Israel will be named the priest of the Lord. They will finally be the kingdom of priests they were meant to be. Reading a good, really good, challenging book right now on, on the fact, just dealing with the fact that we are called priests. In fact, we believe in the New Testament priest of the believer, right? The priesthood of the believer means that the moment you get saved, you actually become a priest. It means you have direct access in the presence of God. You know, priest's fundamental purpose is to draw near to God. To draw near to God and make him known to others. That's what priests do. You're a priest. Is that what you do? That's what you're made for. Be a royal priest. You're a child of the king of glory. We have so much to look forward to.
We have so much to tell the people who are living in brokenness and the squalor of their sin, and they think they call it freedom. They call it choice. They call it their pleasure. They call it their whatever. And they just live in squalor. Well, they may have wealth. They may have things surrounding them that make them prop up and look good. They may wear nice clothes. They may wear drive nice cars, live in nice homes, but they live in squalor. Because without Christ, everything they have is a facade. The facade will crumble around them and destroy them forever. And so priests are meant to speak the truth. Priests are meant to minister to people the word of God. You're a priest. You're to draw near. And then you're to take that word to others. That's what priests do. That's what we're called to be. We are now, as a church, priests of the Most High God. Israel will be that kingdom of priests in the coming millennial kim- temple. They will fulfill their role in that, temp- in that period in the millennial kingdom. They will fulfill that role. They will draw near. They'll serve in the temple. They'll make God's word known. So we're to do now as we look forward to then being in the presence of our king in a kingdom that will never end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. It's power, it's authority, and it's ability to change our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you'll do just that. Help us to open our eyes and visual forward. To consider the blessings that will be ours, that will be enjoyed in your presence. May we long for it, Lord. May we look forward to it. May we look forward to the time when we'll see you face to face. And we'll dwell in your kingdom and we'll serve you with perfect righteousness. No more mixed loyalties, no more mixed affections. The Lord will actually love you with a full heart then. We'll serve you with, with all of our life and all of our energy as we should now. Help us to embrace our true identity as being royal priests of the Most High God. That we'll engage in priestly activity that we will draw near to you. Find our greatest joy in your presence and then in making you known. 